Welcome back to Reading Bear. Today, we will take a look at some new Mauritius compliance stories. And if you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comments. Let's go! The first story is titled, Tennis Coach Got Exactly What She Asked For With A Few Extra Bruises. When I was in high school I was on the tennis team, and our varsity coach was a saint. The JV coach, however regularly made us wonder if she'd been dropped on her head as a child. To boot, she barely understood anything about tennis, so all the poor junior varsity kids got taught how to grip their rackets wrong and hit wrong, and us varsity kids would reteach them when she wasn't looking. It was a small town, so the whole tennis team was maybe 30 kids. On varsity our coach would set up cones around the court for us to try to hit when we were serving, so we could improve our aim. If you hit one, then coach owed you a snow cone from the local stand in town. The cones were famous around town and everyone loved them, nothing tasted better after a long practice in the heat. The JV coach, once again making us question her mental capacity, told the JV kids that if they hit her then she'd buy them a snow cone. I really don't know how hitting her, which would be out of bounds, was a good way to help them improve their aim. Anyways she never specified that the offer only applied to JV, so soon enough the varsity kids took her up on the offer and started pegging her every time she was on the varsity courts. We'd always apologize profusely and pretend it didn't happen on purpose, but she was true to her word though and always bought us a snow con. The poor woman probably bought about 10 snow cons a week for the varsity kids, until the varsity coach put a stop to it. The next story is titled, Bank Selectively Enforces Rules, Loses Business and Money. So this is my dad's story rather than mine, but I felt it might amuse some and is probably the only time in his nearly 70 years that he has done something like this. TLDR at bottom for the impatient among you. Also not sure if it's fully malicious compliance, or one of the levels of revenge, so sorry if I chose wrong. In the 1970s with the UK suffering a recession and work hard to come by, my then childless dad had an opportunity to move to Dubai to work. My mum was able to go with him, they'd have accommodation provided, a good income, higher than the UK equivalent would have been, and were able to fly over and check everything out before committing. All in all, a great opportunity. They took the plunge, and decided as they had no accommodation costs in Dubai, they would keep paying the mortgage on their UK house so it would be available to them if, when they returned. My parents had a UK current account with one bank, let's call them Goodish, but their mortgage and savings account with a different bank, let's call them Muppets. Every month dad's salary was paid into his current account with Goodish and he'd then phone him to ask him to move money into his savings account with Muppets, as this is the account his mortgage payment came from, he never had any problems. One day, mum writes a check from the Goodish account, then later realizes the account will not have sufficient funds to cover it. No problem, thought dad, I'll give Muppets a call and ask him to move some back out of the savings. Unfortunately, Muppets didn't want to transfer money out of their account, and so informed dad that the only way he can remove money from that account is in branch, in person, using his savings book. Now, Muppets didn't have a Dubai branch in the 70s, the only way he could comply would be to travel 3,500 miles home. Frustrated at their repeated refusal to help, Dad resolves the immediate check issue another way, and looks at when he'll next be in the UK. Fast forward a couple of months and Dad is back in the UK. Armed with his little savings book, he strolls into his local branch of Muppets and asks for confirmation of his savings balance and mortgage balance. He then hands over the mandatory savings book and requests to withdraw the full savings account balance in cash. Dad then pays off the outstanding mortgage in full, and asks for an envelope for the excess. Dad then closes the savings account, walks to Goodish, and deposits the remaining savings. Bank manager tried to stop this happening, but once Dad pointed out that he technically isn't able to transfer money into his savings account without using the savings book, he'd have no way to pay the mortgage, the mortgage itself had no restriction on early repayment, and thus he could do what he liked with his own money. The next story is titled, How I Got the Final Laugh at a Slum Lord. Years ago, college days, I had a slum lord. For example, he was an unapologetic ass, barged into girls' apps to show new potential tenants unannounced, even when the girl was naked in bed he still wouldn't leave, but continued to show the APPT. In our state they are required to give 24 hours notice before entering. In my app, I complained about a leaky sink in February, 40 gallons a day when I measured it, and it took him until November when I found a sink, new in box, at my back door. 
I called him about it and he said he thought I'd get the hint and install a new sink myself. The firebox to control the alarms was outside my door and it was faulty and would go off 3x a day, night and I would have to dash to the box to reset the alarm. Kept calling him about it and he didn't care. Keep resetting it, he'd say. Q malicious compliance x1. I started calling the fire department every time it went off instead of resetting it. The FD would have to come down to investigate, reset the alarm and leave. After the third call, event, they started fining him, I think it was like 1000 bucks, for each event. The fire alarm was fixed within a day after that. When I moved out, I mailed the key back to him too late, he received the key on the 4th, when technically he should have had it on the 1st. Mind you I was vacated, moved out by the 1st, but the mailed key didn't arrive to him by then. I had even cleaned the entire APPT spotless, better than it was when I moved in to ensure he wasn't going to give some BS reason to keep my deposit. So he took me to court for $3,000, 3 months worth of rent, because he didn't get his key back by the 1st. I told the judge the story, but he said other things didn't matter, technically I should have gotten the key to him by the 1st. He asked the landlord, when did you rent the APPT, and he replied within 2-3 to three weeks it was rented. So the judge ruled that 3 months rent was ludicrous, and the APPT was rented within a month, but since the technicality said he didn't have the key on the 1st, I would owe him 1 month rent. Q malicious compliance x2. Your honor, I am but a lowly college student with very little income. Can I make payments in the amount of $50 a month until the debt is repaid? And like that, it took this guy 20 months to get his damn $1,000. And I wrote one letter in each check's memo, ducky repeatedly. The next story is titled, You think I'm trying to steal your money? Have it your way then. Some background, I'm a commercial and industrial HVACR technician. We specialize in large AC and refrigeration systems, mostly involving chillers. It's first thing on a Monday morning when I get a customer's call in about one of their chillers being down. Cool beans, I don't have much on my schedule for today and haven't even left the house yet. This sounds like a great place to start off the week. I get there and find all kinds of problems with this chiller. We're talking at least a week worth of repairs, assuming all the parts come in the next morning. For some context, this machine is absolutely ancient. By this point I'd lost count of how many times we'd tried to sell them a new on. Regardless, I make some phone calls so I can work up a price on the repairs and see how soon I can get the parts. A few minutes in and I find out the manufacturer no longer supports this model. No big deal. I explain to the customer that we can either replace it or retrofit it. In my opinion, retrofitting a machine this old is a waste of time and money, but we have to give them the option. It pays just fine either way. After a 30-minute conversation with the customer and several lengthy phone calls the customer decides it's finally time to replace the chiller. I tell him he'll get a quote in the next few days and talk to our sales team who sends it their way. Within minutes of receiving the proposal the customer is blowing my phone up about how the price is too high and we're trying to steal their money. I'm driving so I can't talk, but have my phone mounted where I can see any calls and or texts I receive. After about 15 minutes I pull onto the shoulder and give him a call back. He's still pissed and starts yelling about how we added extra stuff to the quote just to take their money. Here's the thing, this new chiller uses a different style compressor than their old one. These new compressors are really really loud. Normally this doesn't matter, but this chiller sits less than 100 feet from a large neighborhood and a daycare. The unnecessary extras he's complaining about are the sound dampening options for the chiller. Are they expensive? Sure. At the end of the day though, it doesn't really matter. They're going to need them. I tried multiple times to explain this but he refused to listen and informed me that our conversation was over. Give me what I want or I'll find a company that will. You know what? Sure thing boss. I inform our sales office who had me hand deliver the new proposal along with a document explaining the issues with what he's asking for. I had him sign it and left him a copy. Three months and a few hundred thousand dollars later and guess who can't run their brand new chiller? Why might you ask? It violates the city noise ordinance. Any time it starts up they get fined. Need to fire it up to do maintenance? Fined. Need to fire it up because the other chillers are down? Fined. Control system hiccups and accidentally starts it up? Fined. 
Their brand new chiller is nothing more than a big expensive paperweight. Even better though is that we're currently installing all the sound dampening equipment we originally quoted. However, as we're having to change everything out in the field instead of it being installed at the factory, it's going to cost almost three times as much as it would have in the first place. But hey, maybe they'll listen next time. The next story is titled, You Need a 15 Day Notice. Fine. A few months ago, I put in my two weeks notice, starting on a Wednesday because our pay period ends on Tuesday, and I didn't want a one day paycheck. A week into it, my general manager told me that because it started on a Wednesday, my final day has to be a Wednesday. I tried to tell her that would make it 15 days, not 14. She wouldn't have it. After a bit of back and forth, she mentions that since my note said that my notice starts on Wednesday, then my last day had to be a Wednesday. Me, so, if my note said Tuesday, then my last day would be Tuesday. GM, yes, that's what I'm saying. Me, alrighty then. I immediately go back, get my note and cross off the original date and put one day earlier. I put it back on the board and tell my GM that my last day will indeed be on a Tuesday. She looks a little confused and goes back to look at it. GM, fine, then. I know it isn't much, but it really annoyed me. The next story is titled, Do not make any contact with anyone from work. Once upon a time, I was working with a major Australian telecommunications company. I worked in a call center with a group of underemployed lateral thinkers. It made work great as you were always discovering new things, but it made us a bit of a challenge to manage as the department tried to hobble us to fit into the cookie cutter molds they expected of call center operators. We had a manager who was, if I was to be generous, useless. He once went on leave for two weeks without a replacement being arranged. I put a balloon with a face drawn on it at his desk as our interim team leader. Team productivity under Mr. Balloon was measurably better than when the team leader was there and I proved it with reports and all. Suffice to say our manager did not command respect. Fast forward a few months and one of my colleagues figured out how to spoof emails. Our manager had a certificate he proudly presented on his desk saying he had graduated something something college having completed a course in frontline management. He was extremely proud of this. And so the target vector was clear. My colleague went to an internet cafe back when they were a thing and sent a spoof email to our manager. The email was built to look like it was from something something college. The email demanded that manager provide evidence of his competence as a frontline manager or his certificate would be withdrawn. Now, manager's world was appropriately shaken when he got this email. He must have complained to the appropriate higher ups because the infosec squad jumped straight onto it. They traced the email back to the cafe's IP address. Okay, in retrospect, we could all see this error in judgment. They printed out mugshots from the company's internal directory and identified my colleague as being the person who sent the email. Colleague was pulled into a day's worth of meetings as manager, manager's manager, etc. all lent on him pretty hard trying to get him to confess so they could dismiss him for misconduct. I think the company realized they were on shaky ground to try and prove that colleague had really done anything wrong. Oh the days before, bullying, was codified. Having sweated colleague all day with no effect, manager's manager put him on paid leave pending investigation with strict instructions do not make any contact with anyone from work as they didn't want rumors of a pleb messing with the ruling class getting out. Months pass. Colleague has not been in the office. The company has completed their investigation but need to let colleague present his defense. But his mobile is disconnected and he has connected a new number with a competitor. And he has moved home and he is not replying to emails. He has ghosted. And the company doesn't know what to do. More months pass. I guess it gets to a point where the company can declare colleague legally dead. Or at least say he has abandoned employment. They stop paying his wages. A few months pass. Manager's manager is walking through a business district in the city and runs into colleague. Colleague is in a flash suit, with a briefcase, obviously hustling to a meeting himself. Manager's manager says, hello. Asks colleague what he's been doing with himself. I work for, major tech company, now. I've been working with them since, couple of weeks after he was put on paid leave. I would have told you, but I was told not to communicate with anyone from work. Thanks for that second paycheck though. One of the best instances of MC I have witnessed and probably the most profitable. 
The next story is titled, Fine then, I will waste the company's money. For my first office job, I had a horrible boss. She would yell at me and berate me every time I would ask her about something, and consistently told me I had a horrible memory, and that my memory was worse than her 80-year-old grandma's. She must have thought that was clever because she said it over and over again. She even hit me on the head with a notepad once from behind, in front of someone else as she said something demeaning to me. I should have just quit, but also really needed the money at the time. So, when malicious compliance became an option, I took it. One day my boss asked me to set up a bunch of accounts with different websites, and gave me the company credit card to pay for the ones that cost money. The next day, I had to let someone else use my computer at work, and used a temporary one. I needed to use Microsoft Word, but I wasn't logged in on the temporary computer. I checked our passwords log for the password to the Microsoft account, but it wasn't there. I asked my boss for it, and she got mad at me, saying we just set up all of these accounts yesterday and put the passwords in the password log. I explained that the company had had a Microsoft account long before I'd gotten there, and on my old computer I didn't have to log into it because it was already logged in when I started using it. She realized we hadn't set up an account with Microsoft the day before, and apologized. Then, she told me to go set one up, since we hadn't done it the day before. I explained that we already had one that I'd been using, but I don't think she understood the concept that you don't need a separate account for each computer, because she used the company's Microsoft account on her computer every day. She told me that we hadn't set up the Microsoft account the day before, and insisted again I had a terrible memory. She thought I thought we had set one up the day before, and that she had to remind me we hadn't. I gave up trying to explain I just needed the password for the account they'd already had for years. She told me to use the company credit card to go set up an account with Microsoft, so I did. I got a one-year subscription, which cost $130, and they would have to renew it each year. I left shortly after that. I don't know if they still use that account, but I'd like to think that they do, and that in the past few years they've had to renew it a couple of times, paying $130 to do so each time. The next story is titled, I tried to maliciously comply, based on two years of knowledge. It backfired. I'm a huge phantom of the opera fan. I own the original Broadway recording box set on CD, and wore out the script book and probably the CDs as well. I own the movie. I used to fall asleep to it at night. This of course was followed by many other Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals, and then musicals in general. It comes to no surprise, then, that when a special came up for free on YouTube back in April I set multiple alarms to make sure I didn't miss it. On the other hand, you have my boyfriend. He listens to Electronica? Something, I don't even know. No lyrics, lots of bass, and repetitive more often than not. When we drive together we drive with no music. Long drives we'll do podcasts or books. He's not a music person, and that hasn't changed in the two years we've been together. We've adapted. I don't watch musicals in front of him, he keeps his music away from me, and we find occasional common ground. We recently moved. We are staying with his family, so are in a room together far more than either of us would normally be. This leads up to the YouTube premiere. I tried to watch it before he'd be home, but that didn't work. So I basically told him tough crap, deal with it this once. Grumble grumble, fine. He played on his phone and ignored everything else, I cried when all the phantoms teamed up for an encore, and that was that. Or so I thought. Cue tonight and the reason for this post. We've had a few very stressful days trying to apply for a home loan, and now having to settle in APPT hunting. We've been sniping at each other. He smokes some CBD, which helps with the pain of a slipped disc and calm his anxiety, goes to bed and I think he's asleep. Play Phantom of the Opera. What? My musical hating BF is requesting my favorite musical and songs of all time. He must be high. I'm messaging a friend, cracking up laughing, shaking the bed, and decided to do some malicious compliance. I pull up Spotify and put on that wonderful song. You guys. I expected him to tell me to turn that crap off. I expected him to not remember his request and get mad at me for being loud. I was damn near in tears in expectation as to what was about to happen. I did not expect him to tell me to turn it up. I did not expect him to tell me he liked the Phantom's voice. Or to play it again. And again. And again. 
we cuddled in the dark and listened to Phantom of the Opera and then Music of the Night for a half an hour. He fell asleep to it. I stopped it, and he woke up and asked me to keep playing it, which I did until he fell asleep again. I don't know if he'll remember this in the morning. I don't care. I'll probably use it against him in the future. I doubt he'll ever request it again, and if I put it on I'll get the expected response, turn that crap off. I tried so hard to maliciously comply to what all of my experience said he was going to hate. 100% not what I expected. The next story is titled, You're Counting Minutes? I can count seconds. The backstory takes a little while, but basically the partner I worked for had let a project slide and was behind the eight ball with a big client deadline coming up. I had a free weekend, so I offered to work late a couple of night and through the weekend to get it all caught up and ready. I wanted the overtime, I had a trip coming up, and he was thrilled to be bailed out. I took over a conference room and spent a few hours Friday night, plus most of Saturday and Sunday getting all the files in order and correctly documented. I probably put in a total of 18 to 20 hours, which would have put me at around 55 hours for the week instead of my normal 35. I was stoked because the first 10 extra hours were straight pay, $20 per hour, but the next 10 were 1.5x, $30 per hour. I was pretty beat on Monday, but I'd scored $500 in OT pay, before taxes, and was feeling pretty rich. Monday morning I showed the attorney and he couldn't stop thanking me. Monday afternoon, though, I got called down to the HR office, yes, the same HR lady from before, where I was informed that they were very upset that I'd worked over 45 hours because the firm did not like paying 1.5x overtime. I was perplexed, because I knew that they were billing the client $95 per hour for my time, so the extra 20 hours that netted me $500 was billed to the client for $1,900. They were clearing $1,400 on the deal and they hadn't missed the deadline. I tried explaining that but she was adamant that it was a real problem and that it could not happen again. I don't know if she saw me roll my eyes, but I promised it wouldn't. I went back to my cubicle and figured it was over. Nope, not so fast. A couple of days later HR lady called me to her office with good news. I was getting a promotion and a raise. The promotion was to the exact same job I already had, literally no difference at all but a title. The raise was $500 a year. And the catch was that I was now salaried instead of hourly, which meant no more overtime, ever. Yeah, I know better now. Super illegal and super unethical. Here's the malicious compliance. Okay, so you don't want me to work overtime? Fine. From that day forward, I wrote down the exact minute I got to my desk. 8.57? That's what I wrote, not 9 o'clock. Back from lunch two minutes early? Write it down. Phone call kept me at my desk until 5.06? It's all on the desk calendar. And at the end of the week, on Friday afternoon, I'd take time to tally it all up company time. And if I showed that I'd worked an extra 17 minutes that week, you bet I carried my ass out if they're at 4.43. It was petty AF, but for the remaining year or so I worked there I put in exactly 35 hours a week. Not 34 to 58. Not 35, 03. 35, 00 on the dot. I'd never been that way before. I probably averaged 15 to 30 minutes of extra time a day that I didn't claim as OT. I was just doing the job. But when they showed how closely they were watching my time and then took advantage of me to screw me out of even the opportunity for the OT I was legally entitled to. Well, let's just say I could count minutes better that they could. No matter how much of their time I had to spend to do it. Postscript, I'm a manager now, with almost 20 direct reports and I refuse to give anyone crap about petty time issues. If you are getting the job done, we are going to be okay. And surprise. My staff gets the job done. Who could have guessed that respect and appreciation would go further than pettiness and penny pinching? The next story is titled, Jealous Girlfriend Keeps Boyfriend From Getting His Lost Wallet Back. This girl's jealousy is insane. So I'm at my local grocery store minding my business when I see a man drop his wallet. I try to yell at him that he dropped his wallet but I guess he didn't hear me. I would freak out if I was in his shoes so I pick it up. I'm quite slow walking due to my pregnancy and some leg issues by the time I picked it up he was out of the aisle so the chase begins. It didn't take me long to find him. 
I walk up to him and Bali get out excuse me you, when jealous girlfriend spits out don't speak to my boyfriend. I try to explain he dropped his wallet but she keeps interrupting me telling me to stop speaking to him, he's taken, and he wouldn't be interested in a fatty like me which took everything in me not to laugh cause I I'm very obviously very pregnant. I'm really annoyed the boyfriend's not stepping in but I try again to explain jealous girlfriend is not having it. This where she messed up she interrupts yet again and says, he's not interested just duck off and stop speaking to us, I was done at this point so I just look at them tell them to pat their pockets and leave them alone just like she asked. I ended up taking it to customer service so they could handle it. I probably didn't handle it properly or I could have just thrown it I guess but I was just trying to be nice. I also am wearing a wedding ring so I'm not sure why she instantly thought I wanted her man. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel and post some bear emojis in the comment.